All right, so in this last session, uh, myself and Jonathan from the ANSYS team are going to be talking about uh, digital twins and what's been going on in that space. And I guess this is, a, as we said, this one, one of the areas where PDC and ANSYS have been working uh, closely together, okay? So, you know, I talked before about the, the whole digital physical convergence, how that's changing things. So, you know, what we have is these digital prototypes out uh, that we're building, our, our CAD models, our simulation models that we use to, to build a product. And then we've got the physical product out there in the real world, okay? So really what Digital Twins is about is sort of combining that information together. So our physical product, you know, more and more of them becoming censored and smart, so we're analysing that information. Wouldn't it be great if we could feed that, that information from the real world into our digital prototype, okay? So through a product like ThingWorks, I talked about the ability to gather information from multiple systems, we can start to do that, okay? And what we end up with is building this concept of digital twin, okay? So that's the digital representation of a real world physical occurrence out there to help us better understand that its state, its performance, its behavior, what's happening with it, okay? So there's a lot of, a lot of talk about digital twins, you know, there's lots of definitions out there. Um, but really, you know, this comes back to the, the ThemeWorks platform we talked about before. And what we're gonna be looking at uh, in our digital twin side is really where we're getting into um, the synthesized part about um, analytics and analysis. So we've got our digital information coming in, we've, we've got that modeled up. What is that information telling us? So we start to look at things like analyzing the data or doing simulations on the data, okay? Through, as I said before, Creo, or what we're going to talk about is ANSYS, okay? So um, now going back to our uh, Back to our digital company, we've got a digital thread, our digital twins in the middle there that we talked about earlier this afternoon. Um, the different use cases for digital twin. So things like closed loop engineering, okay? How do we use digital twins in that area? Or things like uh, our operational asset intelligence. Or on the service side, predictive monitoring or remote service. These are really the sort of the three key use cases where companies are looking at using digital twins, okay? So talk about that in a little bit more detail, the closed loop engineering, you know, as we talked before, we've got our, our digital prototype there that we've gone and built, and while we were building and designing that, we made assumptions about how it's going to be used, what the load conditions might be on that, okay? But then we actually have a physical population out there, maybe it's our, our first prototype out there for field testing, or maybe it's a product population out there being used by users generating real world data, okay? And you know, the problem is we've got the assumptions that we've made and then we've got the reality of how it's being used. And you know, users, well, they're the worst, right? They don't use it how we want them to use it, they use it how they're gonna to decide to use it, okay? And that could potentially lead to problems, warranty claims, and other things like that. So from an engineering perspective, what we can do is we can take that real world data and use that to replace those assumptions that we made during the design phase and replace that with facts, the factual data that's coming through from that product population. So from that, we can look at optimizing our product quality, maybe building a better product, maybe building new products to meet new markets we might not have known about when we first launched this product. Okay, so give us that better understanding of how to, how to basically drive our design process. Okay, so we can take those digital models, those 3D models and simulations that we built to help us better understand how to build a better product. Okay, so that's one example of a digital tool. Uh, on the operational asset intelligence side, here we're talking really with getting into like the industry 4.0 side of things, the factory floor, okay? So we're looking at optimizing you know, manufacturing operations, work productivity, things like OEE, like Brett talked about it in the, uh, in the ELSA video, okay? So we're looking at combining data from our different systems out there with connected operational assets like our robotic piece of equipment to ge uh, you know, generate better insights, get an understanding of, and look at improving things like OEE, okay? So, that's what, as I said, it's really all around industry, what Industry 4 is really about, okay? And then the other part, and probably where there's a lot of interest on this, is on the uh, predictive monitoring remote service, okay? Our, our assets out there in the field, how do we better maintain, uh, maintain them, service them, understand what's happening with them, okay? So we want to, you know, as, as more and more companies move towards servitization of their business, you know, we want to make sure our customers are happy, that the uptime is always there, we also want to lower the service cost to us as the uh, as the supplier of that service, okay? So we look at things like, you know, we've got our pieces of equipment out there in the field. It could be one, it could be a whole bunch of them, right? So we might do simple things like basically set up some predefined uh, conditions for alerts, okay? So we define, here's a range. If it goes above that range into a critical area, tell us something's going on. Ping us an alert, 
Okay, and we saw how thing was flow could help with that sort of process of generating that alert, sending that information through. Um, where a lot of people want to go, uh, we can start to look at things like machine learning, okay, well, there's so much interest in AI out there. So rather than setting up a hard alert, we can teach the machine to detect normally. So we can say, well, here's the machine operating normally, but then it's going to get into the red zone where something abnormal is happening. So we haven't defined that, the machine has worked that out, and then it can generate that alert automatically for us. Okay? Well, I guess where a lot of people really want to go that I've talked to is things like predictive analytics. So based on all of that data, you know, I want to know, well, all these pieces of equipment, every 12 months I send someone out there to service them, regardless of how it's performing. Okay? What if we have a piece of equipment that's going to fail early? What if we can extend out the service life by another six months? Maybe we can have some, some cost savings there. Okay? So this is where we're starting to look at extending out our life, making sure that our, um, basically helping to reduce our costs, making sure our customers are kept happy. Okay? And for a lot of people, that's, that's the holy grail, is that sort of analysis-based, telling us what we should be doing, okay? But there's problems with that method as well, doing using analytics for that, okay? And that's where I'm going to hand over to Jonathan to talk about the, uh, the where the analysis side of things comes in rather than analytics. So part of this is all great, you know, it'd be wonderful if we knew exactly how long a bearing lasted for, or exactly into what situations, you know, a certain product would reduce its life cycle, you know, for whatever reasons. Uh, but before we can do that, we kind of need to know like all those different scenarios you might have. So the first problem we have with analytics is we it can just take a long time to collect data. You know, if it's a car, you need multiple cars to have done sixty thousand kilometers to know when you need an engine rebuild or how many kilometers it'll take to you know change your oil uh, before you need the next service. So there are certain types of problems that we simply can't solve before we've got a large enough data set to start drawing some conclusions. Um, there are occasions where the sorts of scenarios which uh, happen in real life vary so dramatically that we can't really start pulling anything useful out of them. Uh, case A is so different from case B that we can't actually compare the two. They're just too different in order to work out what actually changed and what's important. Um, sometimes you know, we don't have the luxury of running what ifs. You know? It's all very good if we could crash a car 15 times on all different angles to work out what could be. But that requires you to build 15 cars and be happy to write them off before you even start selling them. Uh, and there are some other things where it's simply, you know, we can't measure. A classic case is uh, when they first launched the space shuttle, they couldn't replace temperature sensors in certain spots, and they couldn't put uh, speed sensors in certain spots. And so the way they did it was they had the little micro infer what those sensors were. And that's the sort of situation where we start adding simulation to the picture. So, um, simulation gives us the opportunity to add a lot more complicated analytics to what our thing works was already calculating. Um, and so the first part of that is we can we've already done lots of R and D to work out you know, how a product performs. We've got ANSYS models of where we've got you know, thermal models and flow models. Why don't we take those and use them in parallel with our real object in order to generate? Um, a physics-based model, and that way our real life can feed into the simulation, and the simulation can help us fill in the blanks. So the nice part about this is the simulation always reflects reality. If you're going to have a widely varying uh, environment, all those environmental variables are naturally considered by the simulation anyway. So that gives you the opportunity to go straight away, and anything that was hard, you've all of a sudden got a model which understands how to work with that sort of data. Um, if you're going to simulate a car crash, it's actually basically free to crash a virtual car. Other than the compute time, you can spend all day crashing a car in whatever scenarios you like, and it's not going to really cost you anything, and there's no safety hazards involved. So you definitely have the opportunity to do what-if analysis on just about whatever you'd like. Now, simulation can also produce what we call a virtual sensor. So if you know the rough external um, uh, inputs for the simulation, and then you have to have a simulation with a sensor at the right spot. Um, then the simulation can generate that virtual sensor data for you, and that can be an extra piece of data uh, which goes into your analytics model. So, in terms of how you do this in practice, um, as so far, the platform is eventually uh, ThingWorks, that's where we'd like to deploy to, and so we kind of work backwards from there. So ThingWorks isn't a cluster. We don't have a thousand cores to run on. So whatever models we use have to be very, very efficient. And so that's where we come up with, 
we start with wanting what we call a digital twin. So it's a model which runs very, very quickly, but is just as accurate as running the full uh, physics model. And so to make a digital twin, that's where we have uh, ANSYS Twin Builder. And we can use ANSYS Twin Builder to collapse our physics models down. So what used to be a 10 million element CFD run is now all of a sudden a two or three dimensional reduced to a model. And that's the part where you know, we take full physics, we can verify the wrong, and now we've got a very simple little block which runs in a fraction of a second. Uh, there are other sorts of models that we can do where we know how to build it up uh, ahead of schedule. And so we don't really need a ROM for that, but we just need to wire all the bits together. So if you're doing a hydraulic network with pipes and valves and things, each of those is very simple to solve, and we can just wire up a little systems model, and that becomes part of our digital twin. So now to put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. Okay. Alan's going to fire up an actual one live. And yep. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so this is a little, just a, I guess, a, a high level example of what we've got. So we've actually got uh, a digital twin example here. So I've got my little 3D printed housing plugged in, still running, I hope. Um, get the fan going, so that's a good start. So uh, inside this uh, 3D printed case, we've got a Raspberry Pi. The old Raspberry Pi run those tin with the IoT projects. Uh, on top of that is a, an extra board called the Sense Hat, uh, which has some sensors inside, temperature, pressure, humidity, things like that, and a little screen to so see you blink your way. And uh, in the end there, we've got a fan, okay? So at the moment, this Raspberry Pi is uh, essentially uh, running. It's our you know, connected piece of field equipment, so it's out there running away, streaming data, the thing works. So we're looking at you know, power inputs, what temperatures we're getting based on, uh, at the, at the CPU and at the, uh, at the sensor built into that, okay? So uh, we're fitting that down and the thing works, we can look at that inside a, a display and mashup, uh, but at the back end what's happening is we're feeding that data that we're getting from the sensors into our digital twin model and ANSYS, and we basically look at those ROMs to tell us, okay, based on the inputs that we're getting, what are the outputs that you should be expecting? What, is the, what should the temperature really be, okay? So this, in this particular example, we're looking at a scenario where we're using the digital twin to validate that our physical model is behaving like it should, okay? So if something was to um, start to be a mismatch, then we would look and say, okay, well, maybe there's a problem here, maybe there's something wrong, maybe the sensor is broken, maybe there's a motor broken we haven't, we're not checking on, because based on the inputs, we should be getting this value, but the digital twin is telling us we're actually getting this value versus the sensors, okay? So, um, so let's have a look at that. So what I've got here is my uh, my mashup, which I will just refresh because it probably won't be the log on again. There we go. Oh, and we have stopped working because I was talking too long earlier. Let's start the twin again. Okay. So what we're seeing here, this is the uh, this is the digital twin builder. Okay. I'll get Jonathan to explain this, but basically you've got data coming out from ThingWorks, feeds into the ANSYS flat box, and spits out some values. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Simple skip my Okay. Um, so we've got it running. There we go. Now it's fitting data back in. Okay. So um, what we've got is thing works here. So I was talking that that sourcing example before. We create a thing. Okay. So in thing works, we create a thing called the fan pi, and it's got a bunch of properties. Okay. If I refresh them, you can see those property values are changing. So every time there's a data change on that device, it streams that data to my ThingWorks server, and I can see that update happening here at the back end. So as the developer, I can look at that and see what those, you know, the fan speed is, the temperature, those sorts of things. Uh, but what I can do is come back here and, um, and show that in, my, uh, in a UI. Okay, so this is what we call a mashup. So what I'm looking at here is the, uh, the, the CPU temperature and the temperature from the, uh, the, the extra sensor. Okay, so that's what the actual values coming off the Pi are. And what I'm showing over here is the temperature and sensor temperature that the digital twin is calculating should be happening based on the fan speed and based on the power draw, okay, of the CPU. So the idea is that, you know, if I was to um, slow the fan down, okay, then I should start to see the temperature climb and those two should climb in sync together, okay. So it might take a little while, but Twins are running a bit faster, so there's the core temperature going up. Okay. Um, so I can see that start to happen, right? The, the temperature's rising as it gets hotter, as it's running, okay? And the twin will reflect that. If I want to, I can actually um, 
let's make that run a bit quicker. Okay, so what I can do, uh, I've got a little script here, so if I click a switch on the Pi, um, I'll basically run a little script that's going to put it under 100% CPU load. Right, just do a whole bunch of calculations and just really uh, grind it away. Okay, so there we go, CPU's under high load, so the temperature should start to climb up, drop the fan speed down as well. Okay, so the temperature, the core temperature is rising, the tweet core temperature is rising, they're pretty much in sync, which is what I would expect to see. Okay, because everything's behaving correctly. So based on the power input, the twin should be this, and based on the sensor, the temperature is actually this, so they're, they're pretty good, okay? So we could maybe speed the fan up, and what I could do is maybe let's simulate um, the fan breaking, okay? So I don't have a sensor on the fan to tell me if it's spinning or not, I just assume that it is. So I'm gonna electronically switch the fan off. So let's say our fan, our little fan motor just died, okay? So, the simulation thinks the fan is still spinning, okay, but the fan isn't spinning. So what should start to happen is that the, uh, the temperature measured on the CPU should start climbing, but the twin won't, because the twin thinks the fan is running, but it's not. Okay? So what we should start to see, when we give it enough time, is that those two should now start to get out of sync with each other. Okay? And when that happens, faster, 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 we'll get an alert come up on the screen. You might have seen that little big, that big red alert come up here the first time because I, I didn't have the analysis running in the back end. Okay, maybe we'll let that oh, we'll let that run a little bit longer. Maybe we'll slow the fan down. Keep that going, and uh, you can see the core temperature starting to climb. The twin core temperature is staying pretty stable. Okay, and so eventually this thing will start to overheat, and we'll get a warning and alert to say, "Hey, there's a problem. The two aren't in sync anymore," which means something has gone wrong. Right? We're not necessarily saying what has gone wrong, okay? But we know that something is wrong, we need to go and inspect that piece of equipment, okay? All right. But while that's uh, hopefully climbing. You should dive on that. Yep. <laughs> so, Alan actually did a very nice job of doing an overview of this. Um, this is the little link which we have to think works. So it's just a little block which exists in the ANSYS environment and it's simply there to pass data forwards and backwards uh, from ThingWorks. So this happens every second or so, it gets a new set of data and pulls it back. Um, the rest of this is basically, if you've ever done any systems engineering, it should look fairly familiar. It's just a bunch of blocks connected together in series. The only little bit of fancy work is Errol in our Melbourne office built a CFD model of the little Raspberry Pi with a fan on. He ran a couple of different scenarios, and then he pulled out all those bits of data, stuck it into the dynamic ROM builder, and extracted you know, a little reduced or a model of how this Raspberry Pi should work. So that's what this little block is here. It feeds the data back in, and then that's the part that ends up inside ThingWorks. And if Alan's feeling lucky, let's see, we should see the predicting of things called on fire. Not quite yet. Not in the quarter of fire. Running too well today. All right, that's okay. So, the air front cameras we do here. So, that's kind of a live ROM. You know, this one's here for reliability purposes. It simply it sits there and checks against itself to see if the real life predicts what, it, uh, what we should see in the simulation. Uh, there are lots of different types of digital twins. The, the name digital twin initially started off with the real time version, but it's very quickly diverged into just about anything you can think of. Um, another one is brought along the what if scenario. Um, this is a relay for a big power station. It works at hundreds of volts, so you don't really want to shove your hand in there. Um, but a company called Big Contact Electronics uh, sells these and monitors them for clients. And so the idea is that they know in advance when they need to service these, and so they've got a big service contract with each company. Um, and they've spent a lot of time modeling the switch in different scenarios and how long it takes to shift and you know, how much damage it takes uh, with each clip. And so the digital twins for this one's a lot more complicated. So there's, you know, there's opti slaying models, there's some physics for arcing, uh, there's a complete history of all the switching that that switch has done. So that comes in from ThingWorks. Uh, but the only things we can change remotely are the software controls at the start. So we can, maybe we can ask the contact to switch a bit faster, maybe we can ask it to switch a bit slower. But the goal in this case is to be able to control its lifetime uh, a lot more precisely. So let's say that uh, this particular switch is expiring ahead of its release schedule, and we don't have the opportunity to take the entire power station down in order to replace it. 
uh, for you know, a month or two. And so we really want to stretch out the life of the switch as long as possible to avoid unscheduled downtime. And so we sit here and we run lots and lots of simulations and we tweak just these four values here. And then the digital twin predicts what the life will be at the switch as it goes on time. So, you know, it's got lots of anti mechanical inside it. You know, we've done some curve fitting and some measurement data. We've grabbed some equations out of the textbook, and those will get piled straight into the digital twin in order to predict this performance over time. So, in practice, the way this has worked for them is that this blue line here represents how many cycles the switch has done, and then how many, what percentage of failure we would expect to see. So, after you know, about 1,000 cycles, there should be less than a 5% failure rate for this particular design. Uh, what they found in practice without the digital twin is that for some reason, above 1,000, you have a huge spike up of number of failures. We expect to get you know, 10, 20, 30,000 switches, but we're only getting sort of 2,000. And so this is due to operating conditions being you know, a bit more complicated than otherwise predicted. And so what they do is each time a switch was coming up and they started to see a bit of a spike up and you know, switches failing in a particular installation, they pull up that digital twin, they tweak a few of the numbers and see what they can change. And eventually over time they found that they could bring down the failure rate back down to where it should be for that given switch so they could stretch out the lifetime uh, as much as they needed. And so yeah, they, get, they can extend the lifetime up to 100 times simply by tweaking the operating conditions for a uh, given switch. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So that's, um, I guess, a little bit of a look at um, the digital twin technology that Ansys and PTC have. Um, you know, I guess the message is there that, um, that the technology to do a digital twin is available right now. Okay. Again, like I said with the AI, this is not something that's you know five years, ten years away. Companies are building digital twins now. Okay. So they could be a purely analytics-based digital twin, purely with ThingWorks. Or if you need that, you know, all those examples we showed before where you might need more complicated uh, multi-physics solutions, then you can also start to look at building a physics-based digital twin as well, okay? So, um, you know, the big thing is to make sure that you've got the right combination of the digital and physical assets to do it. And you're not going to do a digital twin on everything that you produce that you throw out there into the field. And there's a lot of work that goes into building these things. There's a lot of that simulation and everything else that's done. But where, you know, where the application is critical, where the costs are high, there's absolutely value to be achieved from doing digital twins, okay? Uh, one of the big things is the ability to reuse that R&D work that you've done. You know, at the engineering stage, you know, the design stage, you know, there's all that analysis work that's kept done. And really, you know, once it's into production you, and the parts are out there, it's not really getting used again, okay? Digital twin allows us to reuse all of that, to build on that more to help us understand how the product should be behaving, okay? And the big thing is, you know, these twins, they are something that will be continually evolving over time. You know, as you generate more data, as you get more complex models, as you encounter you know, new situations that maybe you had never thought of before, you can start to evolve that digital Twitter and refine it more, okay? So that's, um, I guess, as I said, a little bit of a, an overview of what, uh, what Ansys and PTC have been doing uh, together in the digital twin space. And I also think that brings our, uh, our event to a, to a close.